Today he will talk on the abundance of minimal surfaces. And just before he starts, uh, uh, it's better if you turn off the microphone uh, during the talk and uh, turn it back on uh, when you have a question. So Antoine, please. Thank you. Um, again, I'm very happy to be speaking here at this uh, conference. So my talk is uh, titled Abundance of Minimal Surfaces. Um, it's in order to convey the idea that uh, minimal surfaces are, are everywhere. And uh, that's the result of uh, the work of uh, many people in recent years. Some of the results I'm going to mention um, are joint work with Fernando Coran Marquez from Princeton, Andre Neves from New Chicago, and Sindro from Cornell. Um, this talk is going to be divided into four parts. The first part, I'm going to um, introduce the conjecture of Piao for minimal surfaces um, and give you some, some context. In the second part, I'm going to give you some ingredients that are essential in the proof of this uh, conjecture. Um, in the third part, uh, it's going to be about the, the statements of the theorems re relevant to the Yao's conjecture. And in the fourth part, I'm going to mention results that are more about spatial distribution for minimal surfaces. So once you know that there are infinitely many of them, you want to know where they are. Let me um, start with the first part. What is uh, the conjecture we are interested in? So the, the setting is you look at a closed Riemannian manifold, which is three-dimensional, and uh, a surface that is embedded and closed smooth inside M is going to be called minimal if it is a critical point of the area functional. So if you move it a little bit, the first variation of the area is going to uh, vanish. So equivalently, it means just that the mean curvature of this uh, surface is vanishing. And um, last time I, I said that minimal surfaces can be viewed as analogs of eigenfunctions. It's a very fruitful point of view. You can also see them as two dimensional analogs of closed geodesics in surfaces. So already Yevgeny Lukomovich mentioned in one of his talks that uh, they behave quite differently actually. So the, even though the definitions are formally very similar uh, there are some qualitative differences uh, between them. So these minimal surfaces as critical points of the error functional, they give information on the space of all surfaces that are uh, say embedded in M uh, because uh, say typically if you have a Morse function on the space, the critical points are the points where the topology is changing potentially. And conversely, if you know a priori something about the topology of, of, of the space of all surfaces, you can get existence information on these critical points. So that's uh, Morse theory, basically, right? And, and min-max theory is about this converse. This uh, a priori topology on the space of surfaces gives you existence of minimal surfaces. So I said that minimal surfaces are um, analogous to geodesics. What happens for geodesics and surfaces, right? Um, Birkhoff, in a long time ago, in uh, 1917, he was the first one to really use min-max methods to construct um, these kind of objects. And what he could prove is that in any closed two-sphere with any Riemannian metric, uh, there exists a closed geodesic, right? So there is at least one closed geodesic. And uh, much, much, much later, Frank Spengert proved in two separate works that are complementary that any closed Riemannian two-sphere, in fact, contains uh, infinitely many closed geodesics. So geodesics that are geometrically different. And uh, the two papers are using very different methods. Franks is using uh, methods from dynamical systems because it can view uh, geodesics 
uh, as a naturally uh, embedded like orbit of, of a flow, for example, the geodesic flow. And Bengert's paper is uh, based on more, more theoretic uh, techniques and uh, complementary. So what happens for minimal surfaces, two-dimensional minimal surfaces in closed three manifolds? In the 80s, Angren and Pitts, they um, devised a general theory that uh, you've probably seen already in, in previous talks that, okay, um, they, they, what they could prove is that in any closed, hmm, uh, it should be closed here, closed Riemannian three manifold, there exists at least one minimal surface that is smooth, closed, embedded. So very nice, very nice objects. And um, after that, it, it was natural to ask, well, uh, are there more, right? So Shinkton Yao's conjecture is exactly that. It uh, asks for uh, infinitely many. So any closed, again, closed Riemannian three manifold should contain infinitely many uh, minimal surfaces. Um, and so the conjecture is true, and the proof is based on a um, more uh, variational approach, so more theoretical methods. You can't really use uh, dynamical systems, for example, uh, in higher dimension. And uh, of course, it builds on the theory, the min-max theory of Angren and Pitts. So a few words about the history of the development. After the paper, uh, after the work of Angren and Pitts, people were not really sure what to do with that. And uh, because they were lacking some, some new ideas that would enable to get more minimal surfaces. The uh, Angren and Pitts could get one, but how to get more? And uh, not so long ago, less than a decade ago, uh, Fernando Cordon Marquez and Andre Neves got interested in that question and they introduced some new methods to this uh, min max theory of Angren Pitts. And that crucially includes the use of some geometric spectral invariants, uh, the so called min max widths that uh, appeared in uh, these talks. Uh, so the definition of these spectral invariants, the geometric spectral invariants, is due to Gromo. And I think Guth rediscovered it independently. Uh, not exactly sure about that. But definitely Gromo a long time ago defined it. And what is cool is that um, these uh, min-max widths were living in a completely different universe of papers compared to minimal surfaces. And, and it was nice to put them together. And uh, so recently, this min max theory was uh, very much improved. And uh, one thing that, that makes me happy is that the generic case is uh, very well understood actually. So you, you have nice area bounds, index bounds, um, multiplicity bounds on the minimal surfaces that the theory is constructing. Um, and you can summarize this as saying that there is generically at least a higher dimensional Morse theory um, for minimal surfaces. On the other hand, the non-generic case uh, remains quite poorly understood. So you, you, you know that the conjecture of Yao is true, but not much else, not much else. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that aspect later. Um, and uh, many people, many people uh, contributed to this theory. I'm going to mention a few names uh, during the talks. Also, there is a parallel theory, parallel to this uh, Angren Pitts min max theory. It's another min max theory, but it's called Alan Kahn theory that maybe you've heard of. And it's more based on analytical methods, so PDE, phase transition. And, um, but essentially it is doing the same thing. So recently there's a grad student of um, Fernando Codan Marquez who proved that the numbers and the, the minimal surfaces 
uh, appearing in, in the two theories are basically the same. They're the same. So, um, there's a question. So is higher dimension Morse theory infinite dimensional? Um, oh, okay. So uh, by higher dimensional, I just mean that instead of looking at geodesics, uh, you're looking at two-dimensional minimal surfaces. But the setting is definitely going to be very high dimensional. You're going to consider currents. Uh, it's not clear if you, you locally have a nice structure on this space. So from that point of view, yes, a very infinite dimensional. But when I say higher dimensional Morse theory, I just mean Morse theory about um, higher dimensional minimal surfaces. So that was it for the uh, rather quick introduction to, to MinMax and, uh, and uh, uh, its relation to Yale's conjecture. So now I want to talk a little bit more about math and more precisely about some uh, important ingredients in the MinMax theory for minimal surfaces. So let me start with the standard weights and their asymptotics. Um, so one way, uh, Yevgeny already talked about uh, widths and mean max, and so I don't think I want to uh, repeat what he said, but one way for me, which is, uh, 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 which is a point of view that I like is to say that mean max theory is a kind of dual of the usual spectral theory for eigenfunctions. So I, I don't have a way to really make it rigorous, but uh, it's the same way as you know, zero sets are somehow dual to sections of uh, some vector bundles. You're given this um, three-dimensional closed manifold. Grumov, in his work about how to measure the size of a Riemannian manifold, he defined a sequence of numbers called min max widths um, that I'm going to denote by omega one, omega two, omega p. So these numbers are real numbers going to infinity, and there are geometric analogs of the eigenvalues of the Laplacian in the sense that the definition of these widths involves um, a min max. So you look at a given p sweep out. You don't need to know what it is, but it piece you out as a family of surfaces. You look at the supremum of the area of a uh, surface in that family, and then you try to optimize, try to minimize the supremum area over all p sweep outs. So omega p is given by this. And um, I'm not going to define p sweep out, but just to give you uh, a heuristic of what it is, it's really just the um, surface analog of the families that you're considering when you, you're defining um, the eigenvalues of the Laplacian using functions. Um, but examples, concrete examples of piece of bells. Uh, you take your favorite Morse function on M, the level sets are going to give you a one-dimensional uh, sweep out by co-dimension one surfaces. Uh, if you look at nodal sets of linear combinations of eigenfunctions, they are giving you uh, higher degree sweep outs, again, by codimension one, real codimension one uh, hypersurfaces. Uh, if you want to look at codimension two, then you can look at, in, say, in, in the symplectic world or co complex world, there are very sp special kind of sweep outs. For example, left shed pencils would those of you who know what this is, it's just a very special kind of sweep out by codimension two um, surfaces. Similarly, linear systems of uh, hypersurfaces and complex geometry, this is just another kind of very special uh, sweep outs of real codimension two surface. So what can you do with these numbers? You, you have these uh, numbers there, they seem a little bit abstract. Um, there are in fact closely related to minimal surfaces and that's the goal of minimax theory, which is to, to explain this relation. So Marcus and um, Fernando Cordon Marcus and Andre Neves, they proved that for any P, this Pth number 
uh, defined by Grumov is actually achieved by the area of a minimal surface. And uh, the detail is that omega p is going to be the sum of mj area of sigma j. mj is a, a positive integer and sigma j is going to be a closed minimal surface. So this e equality is a existence theorem. It says that there, there exists such sigma j that are smooth, embedded, closed, and minimal, such that this is true. And um, the MJs are just positive integers here. You might ask, well, uh, can you control these MJs? The answer is yes. So generically, by the work of Chudosh, Montulidis, and Sindro, um, if the metric is generic, then yes. The, actually, the multiplicities are all one. So you can take MJ to be one. So the omega p, remember they're going to infinity and they're corresponding to multiplicity one areas of you know, surfaces. So already that implies that generically there are infinitely many minimal surfaces. I'm going to come back to this point later. Um, so um, Moreover, these numbers, they are not so random. They, they satisfy uh, a beautiful bylaw that was proved by uh, Lukomovich, Marcus Neves. So Yevgeny talked about that um, previously. So it says that omega p is, when p is super, very large, it's just going to behave like a power of p times the power of the volume. Uh, here c is a dimensional constant and um, and it's uh, not known. So you know it's a positive constant. We don't know uh, what exactly it is because one of the main difficulties in min max theory is that you do not have, uh, you, you, you cannot compute these numbers. These are not computable in any given example, at least for now. Say even a ground sphere or flat torus. So this is what's, um, um, what's happening for the standard weights. So you can think of the standard weights as the analog of the eigenvalues. These standard weights are realized by some uh, minimal surfaces and they have some nice asymptotics. This is what to be remembered from these slides. Um, this is one aspect. So let me move on to another kind of environment, another kind of weights that I'm going to call cylindrical weights. Um, so the starting data here is not just um, the Riemannian manifold M, but you start with the Riemannian manifold M plus uh, an additional information, which is a minimal surface that is stable. So you, if you're given a minimal surface, so remember that the minimal surface S is stable if it minimizes area in a tubular neighborhood. This is the definition I'm going to use in this uh, talk and maybe not so rigorous. Um, so if you're given, given an embedded stable surface S in M, then you can associate to this data a sequence of numbers that I'm calling cylindrical minimal widths and uh, that I'm calling omega tilde P. Again, these numbers are, are going to infinity and they are canonically associated to, uh, to S and M. And um, roughly speaking, I, I want to explain a little bit how they're defined. So let's assume that you know how to define the usual standard weights. Okay. Uh, how do we define these uh, cylindrical weights? You cut your manifold along S, so you get a new compact manifold with boundary, right? And then what you do is uh, you glue infinite half cylinders to this compact manifold along the new boundary, okay? With the product metric in uh, the trivial way somehow. In that way, you obtain a non-compact manifold, which is a smooth manifold, but the metric on this manifold is not smooth. It's just Lipschitz along the, the boundary a priori along the old boundary. Now, now there's no boundary anymore. It's a complete non-compact manifold with cylindrical ends. 
and I'm calling this now compact manifold C. And simply you define the omega p tilde by the p width, the standard p width of this non compact manifold C. Um, and uh, so these numbers are playing a crucial role in the the conjecture, the, the proof of the conjecture. So let me, what's interesting for me is that uh, the conjecture is about closed manifolds or closed surfaces, but uh, in order to deal with that, somehow you need to introduce and understand what's happening in the non-compact case in order to have some information on the compact, compact case. So here's a nonsensical question. Um, what would be the spectral analog of these cylindrical invariants and constructions? So um, I'm, I'm not so familiar with, uh, with uh, eigenfunctions. It could be the Laplace, it could be any other differential operator, but does it remind you of, of um, something? Uh, um, for example, it reminds me of some, some constructions for the eta invariant related to the Dirac operator, but I haven't been able to, to, to conclude that it was a good analogy. Anyway, so you have this new cylindrical width and um, you want to say the same thing as for the usual width. So you want to relate these numbers to minimal surfaces and you also want some asymptotics. Um, so the first thing to prove is that they are these new numbers are also realized by um, by areas of minimal surfaces, and that's actually the case. Um, so same thing, the these omega p tilde are uh, the sum of mj area of sigma tilde j. Mj are positive integers, and sigma tilde j are again some closed minimal surfaces. The key point here is that these are minimal surfaces contained in the complement of S. S, remember that it's the stable minimal surface that you started with in order to define these uh, omega p tilde. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that there is uh, also a vital for these numbers. There is also an asymptotic for these numbers, which I'm going to call cylindrical vylaw. Um, and um, what it says is that um, these omega p tilde are behaving linearly in p. So very different from the standard widths, right? And uh, the leading coefficient here is uh, computable, it's just the area of the stable surface you started with. Yeah. And moreover, you have uh, the, the proof just gives you a remainder term. It's not too hard to get. So you have this natural remainder term, which is a, a lower power of p. So you see this analogy with uh, the standard widths, but already the, this bylaw tells you that these numbers are, are sparser than the usual widths, right? They're, they're linear in p, and um, that suggests that something is, is uh, going to be very different. And one way to 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 to, uh, to describe what this is about is that this construction, this cylindrical construction, is localizing min max theory to the complement of your stable surface S. Meaning, if you know already that there exists a stable surface S, then you can localize the min max theory to the complement of that, and uh, so get some numbers, some minimal surfaces that are. I'm not touching S. All right, so you have these two uh, kind of weights with uh, the corresponding asymptotics and minimal surface theorems. That's, uh, that's what min max theory is about right now. And uh, uh, let me so state some theorems that are relevant to the conjecture of Yao. Remember the conjecture of Yao says that in any closed Riemannian theorem, I feel there should be infinitely many minimal surfaces. Um, so if the metric is generic, 
we've seen that the widths correspond just to the areas of different minimal surfaces because of multiplicity one theorem. And that because the widths are going to infinity, that trivially already implies that you have to have, a, you, you have infinitely many different minimal surfaces. Um, let me remind you what I'm talking about. So you see in this theorem, you have these multiplicities and you know already omega p is, it has to go to infinity. So if the mj are one, then the sigma j, they have to be um, more and more of them. You can't have only finitely many of them in your um, closed manifold m. And so that was due to Friedrich uh, Montelidis and Joe, but um, there was a Historically, there was a first proof of the generic case of the house conjecture, and that was due to Marquez Neves Erie. I'm going to mention that in a bit. Um, so, for non generic metrics, there's an issue which is that these multiplicities can, in principle, occur, and it is a serious issue. So, at first sight, when you first start to think about this problem, you might think, well, this seems to be just a, a detail that you might be able to, to, uh, to uh, uh, it's an issue that you might be able to avoid if you're clever enough with uh, some trick. But uh, afterwards you realize that it's a central problem. And in, in fact, the, the same problem already occurs in the case of geodesics. So in the case of geodesics, you have all kinds of arguments in order to deal with the fact that you might have multiplicities. So multiplicities is a problem because if in that theorem uh, n can be all large, you might, you can imagine that, well, these omega p might just be um, interdisciplinary combinations of just a finite number of areas, right? Just a finite number of areas of uh, minimal surfaces. So multiplicity, is really uh, a problem. And uh, let's see some results that are not um, holding, that are holding in for general metric, not only for generic metrics. So Fernando Coda Marquez and Andre Neves, they proved that uh, the conjecture was true if you have this so-called Frankel property, which is that any two minimal surfaces always intersect. So for example, th this is a restrictive uh, condition, but for example, if reach curvature is positive, you automatically have this uh, condition. So um, again, Marcus showed that conjecture is true if you can um, guarantee this uh, condition. Here, the point is that they don't need the metric to be generic. They don't need anything about, uh, to know anything about the um, multiplicities that appear in uh, the existence theorems. <clears throat> and so the proof uses the min-max theory uh, using the standard widths that I described above. Um, and uh, let, me, let me go back to the theorem. So this is the theorem they start with, right? So they prove that. And suppose you are uh, in the situation where um, um, so I, I'm just going to give you a basic intuition about what's uh, going on. So omega p is behaving sublinearly. That's the whole point, right? Omega p is behaving if you look at this by law, it's behaving as p to a power one over three. However, um, omega p is a linear combination, integer linear combination of some areas. So the intuition is that um, um, if you have finitely many of them, this quantity might, um, um, well, maybe it's a bad way to, to explain that. So in the case where the sigma j are, um, so they, if they cannot intersect, 
then you can use this fact to show that by contradiction, we need to have infinitely many sigma j. So it's a very indirect algorithm. Maybe you just need to, to remember that it's a, a indirect argument by contradiction that uses the fact that the standard weights are behaving sublinearly. Let's see. So that's for uh, that's their case, and uh, so not so long ago I proved that the conjecture is true in general. Okay, um, and um, the proof uses the localized min-max theory that I mentioned earlier and the cylindrical weights. So the basic strategy is that. Um, for Marcus Neves, they need this condition, this condition that two minimal surfaces always intersect. So in general, this is not true. Um, but if it's not true, you can somehow reduce yourself, to focus yourself on a, a smaller region, a small region in your manifold where this condition is true and where you still can, can uh, make min max theory work. So the goal is to find such a region where this condition, this Frankel condition holds. So two minimal surfaces always intersect. But it's a smaller region, so you need to localize min max theory. So this is uh, um, where you apply what I uh, explained to you uh, before using the cylindrical widths. Um, Another thing is, since the proof uses these cylindrical weights and naturally cylindrical weights are defined using non-compact manifold, a lot of these methods um, apply then to non-compact manifolds and certain non-compact manifolds at least. So for example, the conjecture of Yao is also true for finite quantum hyperbolic manifolds. So they're not compact, but they're very close to being compact. And um, meaning that for any such finite volume hyperbolic three manifold, you get infinitely many embedded minimal surfaces that are closed. And uh, this conjecture can more generally be uh, pushed to uh, and generalized as a dichotomy for uh, a large class of non compact manifolds. So, for instance, if your non compact manifold has a metric that's not too crazy around infinity, for example, bounded geometry then you can have a dichotomy of the form, either there exists infinitely many or there exists none. For example, the flat R3 is a case where you don't have any closed minimal surfaces. Um, right, so in the closed case, you already have, always have infinitely many. In the non-compact case, if you're bounded geometry say, then it's either infinitely many or zero, uh, essentially. Okay, so um, these are the results, the general results for the existence of infinitely many metal surfaces. And once you know that there are infinitely many, one thing to, to try to understand is how they are distributed, right? So uh, by distributed, I mean the spatial distribution of these uh, minimal surfaces where there are. And we are going to try to illustrate that point. So we're going to see that generically, it can be both very well distributed, equidistributed, or very uh, concentrated. So let me try to, to explain these results. Don't hesitate to ask me questions, by the way. All right, so the, um, this is the part about spatial distribution of minimal surfaces and um, for eigenfunctions, again, uh, I'm, I'm still playing with this analogy with uh, eigenfunctions. Well, eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, there has been tons of words about how the, say, L2 energy is distributing. And I'm going to mention some superficial, uh, superficially some, some uh, uh, relevant results. So you all know the the usual bylaw for the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Well, there's a local version of the, the, the bylaw due to, I think, Anakumovich. 
And uh, the local bylaw, if you integrate the local bylaw, you just get the usual bylaw. It's a pointwise kind of convergence of, um, of the sum of the L2 densities. So the local bylaw, um, it can be interpreted as saying, on average, you, you take um, a sequence of normalized eigenfunctions, then on average, the sum of uh, the L2 densities are equidistributed. Okay, so that's the local bylaw of Avakumovich. It's uh, equidistribution on average for any metric and sequences of eigenfunctions of the Laplace. Again, about equidistribution, if you impose some more, more restricted conditions, we can get individual equidistribution of uh, the uh, energies of the uh, eigenfunctions. Uh, that comes under the form of this so-called quantum ergodicity theorem of Schneerman, Zeldich, and Colin de Verdier. Um, and that can be summarized as follows. So if, if you consider a closed um, Riemannian manifold with negative sectional curvature, then if you look at eigenfunctions, there is a density one subsequence, there is a subsequence of eigenfunctions such that uh, individually these eigenfunctions are going to equidistribute in your manifold in the sense that the L2 densities are converging to just the, the uniform measure. <clears throat> so uh, you, you see that uh, in some uh, favorable cases, you have a, uh, large sequences of eigenfunctions equidistributing and the opposite phenomenon uh, where uh, a subsequence of eigenfunctions is concentrating, the L2 energy is concentrating along some uh, subregions of your manifold. This is called usually uh, scarring. And quantum scarring, there are results due to, for example, Babish, Latsutkin, Ralston, that are uh, similar to what some, some things that I want to talk about later, and uh, results of hassle about scarring in, um, in ergodic billiards. So basically, in they, they, these results are about the opposite phenomenon. They can show that uh, in some context, generically, you have some subsequence that are uh, con um, concentrating along, say, submanifolds of the ambient space. So you have these two opposite phenomena, uh, phenomena equidistribution and uh, scarring. And you would like to say maybe there's something similar for minimal surfaces. And generically, that's the case. So generically, I'm going to give you uh, some results saying that um, you have some similar, um, similar results for minimal surfaces. So equidistribution on one hand and scarring on the other hand. So re I remind you, we're considering a closed Riemannian three-manifold and uh, the result about equidistribution is this uh, manifold with Fernando and Andre. So we, we showed that if the metric is generic, then there is a sequence of minimal surfaces that is uh, equidistributed on average by on average, I mean that with any pass function that is smooth, you integrate this function f on uh, each minimal surface. You take the sum and then you normalize by the total area of these minimal surfaces. And this has a limit and it goes to the spatial average of your test function. So the integral of f over m divided by the total volume of the ambient manifold m. So that's uh, quite similar to the local bylaw for eigenfunctions. Um, let's see. And um, so it's um, hence an equidistribution on average. Again, we don't really know what happens for each sigma k. We don't know if they uh, equidistribute individually, but you know by this theorem that on average, if you take the sum and you normalize a kind of Cesaro sum, this quantity is uh, well distributed. So the proof of this theorem 
is based on a quantified version of a perturbation argument that is due to Marcus Neves Irie, which is applied to the bylaw of uh, Marcus Neves and Lukumovic. Uh, and let's see. So I remind you this uh, bylaw. Uh, it, it says that omega p is uh, p to a certain power times volume to a certain power. And the perturbation argument going to get a distribution result can be heuristically explained as follows. So the volume is equidistributed. I don't know if it means anything, but it's something that's everywhere uh, equidistributed by definition, right? Okay, so if you modify the metric somewhere in this manifold, for example, at some point, you increase the metric, then the volume of this uh, uh, manifold is going to increase, right? But you know that because of this formula, the volume is related to the p widths, at least asymptotically. You can think of them as equal. So if you increase the volume, you increase the width. But the width by Nimax theory is realized by the area of some minimal surfaces. So that means, at least at a heuristic level, you, in, uh, you expect the minimal surfaces to detect your change of uh, metric. In other words, if you change your metric uh, in a small bowl, you increase the volume, the widths are going to see it. So that means maybe some minimal surfaces are going up or are passing through these bowls, right? And since you can do that in a controlled and uh, more or less homogeneous way and a more and more refined way with smaller and smaller bowls, that means at the end that you, you, you can believe that Indeed, you can construct a sequence of minimal surfaces that are equidistributed in the sense that I wrote down here. Let's see. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So, no, it's not at all density one. So the question is, uh, can you take this sigma k to be density one of density one in the sequence of sigma k realizing the standard width? And the answer is no. Uh, in the proof, we're really uh, using a sparse subsequence. Actually, in this paper, we don't even show that the sigma k are corresponding to the widths. Even though with nowadays, nowadays with some more understanding coming from other papers, we can conclude that actually these sigma k are a subsequence of the minimal surfaces that realize the widths. But the short answer to your question is this subsequence is going to be very sparse. Um, right, so let's see. So that is equidistribution. All right, what about uh, the opposite phenomenon? Um, so the opposite phenomenon for us, it's going to be described as generic scaring along stable surfaces. And what it says, um, we proved that with uh, Syndro recently, and it says that if the metric is generic, then for any embedded stable surface, okay, there exists a sequence of mineral surfaces that are scaring along S. So what I mean by that is that you can construct such a sequence of minimal surfaces, sigma k, such that the area in the index, the Morse index, are both going to infinity, meaning that in terms of complexities, these sigma cases are genuinely more and more complicated. They're not stuck uh, at the lower energy level. And more importantly, the normalized surfaces are, are converging. So the normalized um, surfaces, you can think of them as uh, measures uh, the technical term here is that they converge as variables, but you can think of sigma k over area k as a uh, um, probability measure living, say, on m. Well, this, this measure is converging to the measure of uh, s over area of uh, s. And geometrically, what it means is that on average, the sigma k is going to be concentrated around S, most of the mass of S, the most, sorry, most of the mass of sigma K is going to be located in a neighborhood of S, right? 
Um, let's see. Yes, and moreover, what, what's uh, coming from the proof actually is that these sigma k's are disjoint from the stable surface S. So they're disjoint from this limit, which might at first sound a little bit counterintuitive because of uh, the maximum principle, etc. But remember that these sigma k's, they have area going to infinity, they are in fact disjoint from S. And uh, nevertheless, they kind of fold around S more and more and uh, at the end of the day, they converge to, to S. So for this proof, it's uh, this time based again on the perturbation argument, but applied to the cylindrical violon that I remind you here, which is omega P tilde, is linear in P and it depends on the area, right? Um, so then uh, again, I can, try to give you some heuristic about uh, why this kind of asymptotic can give you a scaring result. Um, if you modify the metric outside of S, so S is your given stable surface. If you modify the metric, say increase the metric far from S, uh, the area of S is not going to change. On the other hand, if you modify the metric in the neighborhood of S, you will change the area of S and so the omega p tilde are going to detect that. And um, again, the omega p's are corresponding to minimal surfaces. So you expect these minimal surfaces to be sensitive only to what's happening to, um, to the metric in a neighborhood of S, meaning that they are located in a neighborhood of S mostly, right? Mostly after we normalize it by the area. And that really is the, the kind of heuristic that you use. So um, at the end of the day, you, if you perturb the metric infinitely many times, smaller and smaller perturbation, you get the sequence of minimal surfaces uh, that are going to be more and more localized around the S. So that's the intuition. Also, let me mention that there's a, a concrete example, rather concrete example by Colding and the Lily. So they constructed the symmetric, rotationally symmetric example of scattering along a stable sphere. Um, for those who, who, who were at my talk two days ago, so remember that I said that uh, for any minimal surface, you can decompose this minimal surface into two parts. First part is non-sheeted, the second part is sheeted. So this notion of sheeted um, depends on the threshold that you impose a priori. So you impose an uh, N0, okay? Given an N0, sorry, it's, it's supposed to be for all N0. So given a threshold N0, you can define the sheeted part and the non-sheeted part. And for these scattering surfaces, uh, what I'm claiming is that they are mostly sheeted in the sense that if you look at the area of the non-sheeted part, if you divide by the total area of G sigma k, this ratio is going to zero. So geometrically, it means that the sigma k at most points on the scale of stability, you see a lot of sheets, more than N zero sheets. And uh, so this, result gives you information about the local, the very local behavior of sigma k, while the scattering result gives you information about the global behavior of these uh, sigma k's. What happens at intermediate scales? I don't know. Um, a last result, so for uh, related again to the scattering, Phenomenon. So for immersed surfaces, scattering is really the rule rather than something exceptional. Um, using the methods of the previous theorem, we can prove that if M is a closed manifold that is not diffeomorphic to a spherical quotient, so for most, in some sense, closed three manifold, then for any generic metric on that, there is a sequence of immersed minimal surfaces that scars along an immersed stable minimal surface S. And uh, the key point is just that by geometrization, you, you have enough topology to guarantee the existence of uh, 
stable surface. And then starting from this stable surface, you can hope to construct a, a sequence of uh, immersed minimal surfaces that are scattering along this uh, um, surface S. Uh, so this is the last result I wanted to mention. And uh, um, I want to conclude this talk by, so first a general principle, right? That, that you see in these uh, equity distribution theorems um, and scattering theorems. This general principle tells you that if you perturb Perturb, sorry, the, the bylaws, that would give you special information about the corresponding geometric objects. So, for example, in our case, the bylaws are, are these omega p's or omega tilde p, and they correspond to minimal surfaces. You perturb the corresponding bylaws, you obtain special information about minimal surfaces. That's a general principle. And actually, in eigenfunctions, I learned recently, for example, that uh, Hassel, in his proof of uh, generic scattering for ergodic billiards, he's using, a, uh, in spirit, a similar uh, kind of uh, argument. He's per perturbing the metric, and he's looking at what's happening for the bylaw and deduces uh, information on the eigenfunctions. For those who know a little bit about embedded contact homology, okay, this has a little more of a topological flavor, but they have their own bylaws, and uh, they can perturb their bylaw. They, they um, obtain results about, uh, about the spatial distribution of read orbits. So in their context, the numbers are corresponding to energies of read orbits. And finally, of course, for minimal surfaces, this, this is all the results I already mentioned previously. Um, one question is, can curvature assumptions help in uh, these uh, spatial distribution results. So I'm not even sure if Ricci positive is better than negative sectional curvature. I really don't know. So that's one question. And um, finally, the case of non-generic metrics is unfortunately not understood at all. Uh, we barely know that the conjecture of Yao is true, but um, all these, the general principle that I just mentioned here by the nature of the method, you need to perturb the metrics. So at the end of the day, you can say something about generic metrics, meaning generic in the sense of their, um, but not for any given metric that you can write down, right? So for example, what happens to the hyperbolic metric? Hyperbolic metrics are beautiful metrics, but for spatial distribution of minimal surfaces, it's hard to, to say much for the minimal surfaces constructed by mean max theory. So this is the end of my talk. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, I think we uh, have plenty of time to take questions. Anybody wants to go first? I have a question actually. Uh, I saw in your uh, asymptotics of the cylindrical width that you said that the multiplicities are positive integers, but you don't, didn't say a result that's similar with, like oh. for generic metrics, it's uh, mostly the one. Uh, mm. Is that because it's not true or uh, it's it not known? actually true. I just forgot to write down, but it's due to, um, so Yang Yang Li, who's a graduate student of Fernando Cona Marquez, so what he did was he, adapted uh, the, the papers of, of uh, Sindro uh, in the case of uh, the standard width to the case of uh, cylindrical widths, And you would get similarly that generically, uh, you can take this MJ to be one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, that is, uh, oh, that is uh, thank you in the uh, chat. Um, I do have another question actually, because you made this analogy with the uh, spectral theory and, and uh, one of, let's say one of the global problems in spectral theory is to understand uh, the manifolds from the sequence of eigenvalues. Is there uh, the, um, I don't know, the beginning of such a theory for widths? Like if you have a certain sequence of widths, you can describe somewhat either topologically or, or, or geometrically some conditions on the metric. 
it's generally still very, very open. So uh, Yevgeny, uh, last time he mentioned some results related to, uh, say, the Ricci curvature. So uh, mm -hmm. it's not completely unrelated, but however, this problem of, say, uh, if is it true that the volume spectrum determines the metric at this locally, this kind of thing. We don't even know if we should expect this to be true. We, we don't really uh, know what's happening here. But yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Thank you. I wanted to ask, uh, how about uh, constant mean curvature? Uh, so I guess you, you could expect uh, related results, right? I mean, for CMC. Right, so uh, for example, first, related result is the existence of one, that's okay, that's true. There is this one CMC uh, surface, or any C that you, you fix. Um, and then the next question is, does there exist uh, infinitely many of them? And uh, one partial answer is given by uh, a student, Akash Deep Day, uh, Marcus, it says, so if you take the C, the constant, the mean curvature, if it's close enough to zero, you can make this number as large as you want. You can't really get infinitely many, but if the mean curvature, you fix it to be very small, close to zero, you can guarantee that you have at least uh, a, a many, many uh, CMC with that uh, mean curvature. Um, for distribution, no, we, we don't know. Uh, but, uh, and sort of just heuristically, can you think that for small c, they would somehow be perturbations of minimal surfaces or, uh, uh, or you know, be close in some sense or something like that? I think for, for, um, for any fixed level, yes. But if you look at, uh, now if you fix the mean curvature, it might be very small, but if you look at higher and higher index, or area such CMC uh, surfaces, there's no reason why they would be close to minimal surfaces, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the mean curvature. Uh, and, and can you have some sort of like, uh, you know, if you have a family of metrics, then uh, you, you, or maybe fix a metric and you perturb and then for some C there exists something close and then there is some sort of bifurcation or things disappear or, or some sort of phase transition. Oh. Um, can it be true or, uh, again, I don't know. Maybe, yeah, uh, I don't know. Let's see, there's a question. There's a question, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question. Uh, could you please describe the cylinder uh, C? Uh, okay. Does it depend on the original metric M? So yes, uh, let me try to go back to, uh, to the slides. Um, okay, so, okay, this, um, so you, uh, you start with a metric on M, right? And you cut along S, the original metric is inducing a natural metric on this new compact manifold fifth boundary. So now you add to this compact manifold fifth boundary some half cylinders along. You glue this along the boundaries, right? So you have a new manifold. It's endowed with naturally with a metric, with a metric, and uh, it is by construction uh, cylindrical at infinity, and the metric is non uh, non smooth. Solutions. Okay, thank you very much. Can I ask a question? Huh? Yes. Uh, so it's following your analogy with the uh, Laplacian eigenfunctions. All right, so you mentioned quantum ergodicity. The quantum ergodicity for eigenfunctions also tells you equidistribution in phase space under some conditions. Mm -hmm. right, so I assume a similar, like, similar question for mean max would be if, if they converge as variables to the right. Uh, right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a, a very good question. As you mentioned, uh, the ergodic, ergodicity theorem is very strong in the sense that uh, it's not only uh, what's happening on the base manifold, but you, you have uh, uh, what's happening on, on the basic cotangent bundle. So here, the uh, analogous question is, 
maybe you can have equidistribution of the tangent uh, planes of those minimal surfaces. The answer is we have, we do have actually something stronger than what I wrote down here. We do have that the tangent plane, these uh, sigma k, they cannot be all aligned. But however, you do not have by our proof that they are equidistributed in the Grassmannian uh, of two planes in the three manifold. So that's uh, so you probably need to assume something more of the manifold because the usual quantum ergodicity is like for if you're geodesically ergodic, right? Then you quantum ergodic, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. So here again, I'm not even sure that sectional negative sectional curvature is helping for this kind of uh, min max surfaces. Um, it's not clear for me that Ricci, Ricci positive is not better or worse than negative sectional curvature. Um, you're right that certainly there should be some uh, additional condition. Uh, but I mean, for, for, for some other, for things like uh, Kan Markovich, uh, uh, there, the gradistic of the frame flow, right? So, right, right. So there so are I, some I, classical gradistic things. That, that's something I, I forgot to mention, which is the result of Kan Markovich. So, of course, Kan and Markovich, what they do is they use dynamical system to construct minimal surfaces. So the minimal surfaces they construct in three-dimensional hyperbolic manifolds, it, they're all immersed, very immersed and uh, stable. Uh, so in nature, they are very different from the kind of objects that are of variational nature here. So the, typically they're all very unstable. These minimal surfaces that I'm considering here are very unstable and embedded, by the way. Uh, and for these ergodic, Theory is not clear how it can help. And I wanted to ask for uh, so on the sort of on the geodesic side and like in function side, uh, you can have like completely integrable metrics uh, where uh, things are somehow easier to write down, you know, eigen functions are products of functions of one variable and uh, yes. Yeah. So is there some kind of special kind of manifold uh, where uh, you would uh, have sort of, we know that sphere is special sort of in any case because you, but mm -hmm. you know, besides some something more general than a sphere where you okay. would have lots of surfaces and then yeah. Uh, so part B of the same question, if you perturb something completely integrable, you have a very nice Kolmogorov Arnold Moser, right, KM theory of how these cylinders uh, break down under perturbation. Mm. So uh, can you expect anything similar for minimal surfaces? Okay, so the, could I mention one uh, case? My answer would be no. My, my, my question, my answer would be at this stage, there's really not even a guess on the constant. There's no good metrics on which you can put your hands on. Uh, that's something. But I have a guess, which uh, I haven't really investigated yet. But my guess is that in codimension two, you might be able to use co complex geometry to compute actually uh, this kind of uh, environment. So maybe the integrable aspect would be uh, uh, translated into the calibrated aspect in uh, complex geometry. So in codimension two, um, Yevgeny already mentioned that he's working with uh, Arguth on a bylaw for the codimension two case. In codimension two, you can hope, this is my guess again, that say in the projective space, you just look at the, the most obvious sequence of sweet belts given by uh, linear systems of hypersurfaces, just, just these are just families of a uh, complex of manifolds. These are all calibrated, all minimal. You might expect that they are realizing actually the, 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 the perfect, uh, the widths. Uh, and hence you could uh, compute everything exactly. Uh, I haven't really thought much about that, but that, that is my guess. Yeah. Okay, any other questions?
If not, I would like to thank uh, Antoine Song for his wonderful talk. And uh, also, I would like to say that this concludes our 2020 Nuremberg lecture series in geometric analysis. And I would like to thank him again for both lectures and to uh, as well to Evgeny Lukomovich for his uh, first two lectures. Thank you very much. <laughs>